It's just after dawn on a late October morning. Wine growers are harvesting their crops on Willamette Valley hillsides. It's like the culmination of all that. Everything you've been doing all through the year now finally is you're rewarded in just a short few days. It's always magic when these factors come together. The coolest summer that we've had in 50 years, one of the wettest. And here we are standing at the end of October, you know, surrounded by just this beautiful, ripe, healthy fruit and grapes. It's wonderful. It's Oregon. That's what keeps it exciting. I mean, after all these vintages, every year is different. Less than 50 years ago, no vineyards graced the landscape of this valley. And fine Oregon wine didn't exist. Today, Oregon is the toast of the world. We enjoy wine, we enjoy food, and most of all, we enjoy Oregon. And a delicate wine called Pinot Noir is the belle of the ball. It takes you places you never knew were there. I think some people go to Cab, they go to Zinfandel, they go to many different wines, but they ultimately come back to the elegance of Pinot. Back in the 1960s, Pinot Noir was a wine most Americans hadn't heard of, didn't buy, and couldn't pronounce either. The wine and the food awareness in this country was just beginning. Here we are. And I think we were just at exactly the right place, at exactly the right time, and maybe just a little bit ahead. They were a band of dreamers. We were the underdogs, and the underdogs sort of stick together determined to make an elegant old world wine where few dared try. The climate is risky here for growing Pinot Noir, but it's also the reason for being here. David Lett and Curry had been told, you know, the rain would wash them out, they would grow fungus between their toes and it would rot their clothes off them and there was no way in hell they were gonna grow good grapes up here. We were experimenting to see if we could create an industry we had no idea where it was going to go. The experiment would take them on a journey few could imagine. You hit doors that slammed in your face. We thought we could take the product and show it to people and convince them that this is the holy grail right here. We were on a crusade to be known for quality. It was a journey that would change Oregon and resonate around the world. A lot of things happened in the 60s and 70s that all came together that made this possible. If it hadn't happened, uh, we wouldn't be here. My mom likes to say that there was Paris in the 20s and there was McMinnville in the 70s. <laughs> and so uh, there was definitely a feeling here that there was something cool afoot. Funding for Oregon Experience is provided by the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation, the Oregon Cultural Trust, and viewers like you. Additional support provided by Kay Kitagawa and Andy Johnson Laird. Thank you. In 1979, a French gourmet magazine sponsored a wine Olympics in Paris. A 1975 Pinot Noir from a small, upstart winery in Oregon placed in the top 10 with a grape that claimed its native home as Burgundy, France. The French were stunned and demanded a rematch. And to our delight, the Ari Vineyards 75 Pinot Noir came in second to a 1959 Chambois Moussigny from Drouin. The news hit the press and it was international coverage of this little Oregon winery that had scored so well. 
And then the, then the New York Times picked up the story and AP picked up the story. My parents were working very much in obscurity, but I can remember the general feeling of joy <laughs> uh, at, at uh, just this amazing sort of uh, flash of exposure. And there were many more steps to take, but that was our first international recognition that what we were doing here in Oregon was good and made sense. It certainly made us, but it, it certainly helped Oregon because after 1980, things really started happening in this valley. Growing grapes in Oregon dates back to the time the territory was first settled. Pioneer Peter Britt, for example, grew wine grapes in the Rogue Valley in the 1850s. And by the turn of the century, Ernest Reuter was operating the family winery in Washington County. But by 1919, prohibition had crushed wine production across the state. After its repeal in the early 30s, many so-called farmers' wineries sprouted, mostly producing fruit and berry wines. But with limited demand, only a few remained in business. Well, my parents, who came through Prohibition, rarely drank wine. I mean, Americans rarely drank wine. Uh, we'd lost a generation of wine drinkers, and there was no continuity. The fizzled wine industry had to start over, with its mild climate, California took the lead, producing inexpensive jug wines. But a new breed of winemaking pioneers was on its way to Oregon. To be in this business, and especially at that point, you have to be a dreamer because there are a lot of reasons not to do this. In 1961, a young Californian arrived in southern Oregon's Umpqua Valley, looking for a cooler climate to experiment with Vitis vinifera, the fine wine grapes of Europe. Hillcrest, where the first Pinot Noir was planted in Oregon, was founded by the gentleman that's considered father of the Oregon wine industry, Richard Summer. Richard Summer had earned a degree in agronomy at the University of California at Davis, America's premier school for winemakers. While there, he'd been warned that Oregon was too cold and wet for vinifera to flourish. Richard listened to what people said, but Richard did what Richard wanted to do. I think it's very fair to say people thought of Richard as crazy. Over the years, Summer planted 35 varieties, but mostly Riesling, Cabernet, and Pinot Noir. And he tended his vines with loving care. Richard was a bachelor his entire life, but he was a man that looked at vines and wines as his children, literally, and he referred to them as his children. And there's kind of a point at which you fall into wine enough that it's a very spiritual thing, and that's hard for many people to understand and how it can change people's lives. He was called eccentric, quirky, and brilliant, and the local folks adored him. Summer released his first wine, a white Riesling, in 1963. Four years later, he unveiled another milestone, Oregon's first commercially bottled Pinot Noir. And Richard, in many ways, captured many firsts from the Pinot Noir, which he's most respected for, first to plant and first to bottle, as well as the first stainless steel tanks in Oregon. Hillcrest has been making fine wine, grape wine, consistently longer than anybody else in the, in the state. In 1961, the year that Richard Summer founded Hillcrest, David Lett had just graduated from the University of Utah, where he'd studied philosophy and pre-med. He'd gone to San Francisco to apply to dental school. And while he was there, he decided to take a little side trip out to the Napa Valley, and he didn't know anything about wine. You know, he grew up in Chicago and Salt Lake City, so not, not too much about wine. And, he saw a young man out in the courtyard of this winery rolling a barrel around, and he stopped and talked, and they talked about wine. I used to tease Dad that uh, he got hit by the cosmic brick. Uh, you know, he didn't know what it was, he didn't know where it was coming from, but uh, it got him. Well, he was smitten with the wine bug immediately, went home and told his parents that he thought instead of going to dental college, he would like to work in a winery. And so his parents were kind of shocked. At that time, there was no glamor in being a winemaker. It was sort of like saying, I want to be a shepherd. <laughs> you know, so they said, well, as long as you're going to do this 
do this thing, we'd like for you to look into really learning it as a profession. Lett enrolled at UC Davis, where he studied viticulture and enology, the science of grape growing and winemaking, earning his second degree. I had a professor there who said one day, there's no climate in California cool enough for Pinot Noir. And I had discovered Pinot Noir at Davis, and uh, I loved it. So I started doing research at the Davis Library <clears throat> on various places in the world where Pinot Noir might do better. One of them was the Willamette Valley, the others were northern Portugal and South Island of New Zealand, where nothing was going on then either. Eager to learn more, Lett spent the next year in northern Europe. There, the winemakers believe that Pinot Noir produces the finest fruit when the grapes struggle to ripen in a difficult climate. Lett returned with a decision. He wanted to grow Pinot Noir, and he had become convinced that the Willamette Valley of Western Oregon was the place in the United States to do this. The Willamette Valley lies at about the same latitude as Burgundy, France. The valley has long and warm summer days, but the nights are cool, allowing grapes like Pinot to ripen slowly so they peak in flavor and complexity at the very end of the growing season, instead of burning out quickly in warmer climates. But in the valley, heavy autumn rains can threaten the grapes' steady march to maturity. If the season is too cold and wet, the grapes will fail to fully ripen or rot on the vine. When I first came up here, the idea of growing grapes in the Willamette Valley was absurd. Um, it was just a theory. And it was a huge gamble. Um, but it was an educated one. We have a file folder about this thick with uh, weather records going all the way back to the late 1940s. And so he was very clearly reading and researching. If I know my dad, he didn't come here because it was easier. He came here because he thought it was better. David Lett wasted no time gathering about 3,000 baby grape vines from UC Davis and commercial growers, primarily Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Pinot Gris, loaded the cuttings into a trailer, and shipped them to Oregon. He planted them temporarily to root at a friend's place in Corvallis. This is David's journal from 1965-66, when he was first getting started here in Oregon. On February the 13th, he says, slowly I am learning to be a farmer. I hope I don't lose all my cuttings while I'm waiting to get them in the ground, and all my money while I'm waiting for a job. The process is slower than I had thought. The ditches are filled with about five inches of loose soil, which is wet and muddy, Rain came heavily Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. Monday was again clear, and the planting is complete. 1st of March, 1965. And it was a beautiful, warm day. I asked him, well, what wine did you use to christen your grape cuttings? And he said, I'm sure it was a bottle of very good Burgundy. To pay the bills, Lett landed a day job selling college textbooks while he searched for his ideal grape land. The Red Hills of Dundee, when I first came here, I avoided. The subdivisions were beginning to creep into Dundee even then. And this place came up for sale and it was just too perfect. About the same time David found his perfect property, he and his future wife found each other on an out-of-state business trip. I didn't know enough about grapes or Pinot Noir or Oregon. I didn't even really know where Oregon was. But he was so enthusiastic about it. I could feel the determination to do this and the excitement. And he told me how beautiful Oregon was. And he was a really good salesman. And I got a rain suit and a shovel for my wedding present. And we started our honeymoon year by digging out all those finds down in Corvallis. When David and I were first planting the vineyard, we noticed that there was a pair of red-tailed hawks nesting in the top of this fir tree. An eyrie is the nest of a red-tailed hawk. We decided that we would name our vineyard 
the Irie Vineyards. We wanted to honor our natural relationship with everything that was around us. This hill, David Hill, years and years ago, had a wonderful reputation for wines. By late 1965, David Lett's UC Davis classmate, Charles Corey, had purchased the old Reuter farm to pursue his own interest in cool climate viticulture. He'd gotten his master's degree by criticizing the practice of planting all grape varieties everywhere and advocating instead that growers match the variety with the climate. This climate, this beautiful Oregon climate of ours, gives a, a uh, characteristic, distinctive flavor to all our wines. They tend to be lighter, a little fruitier, more fragrant than wines grown in warmer regions such as California. Although Corey was often described as difficult, <laughs> his insight would help fuel a fledgling industry. He was a visionary, no question. And, and it kind of spread to the rest of us. In other words, we would be reminded that we were really starting something and we wanted to make sure that it would be preserved for the future. He inspired me a lot, I think, because he, he, Chuck was a very creative sort of thinking guy, and, but he had a hard time putting things into practice. In the mid-1960s, Dick Erath was an electronics engineer by trade, an avid photographer who'd studied with the great Ansel Adams, and a home winemaker in his Walnut Creek, California garage. But one taste of a fine 1955 Pinot Noir changed his life. It has a silkiness to it and texture, it has elegance, it has many little facets to it, and when they're all right, it's, it's beautiful, you know, it's just, it's perfect. And I went after Pinot Noir at that point, and I said, this is the one, what I have to do. His plans took root in a winemaking class at UC Davis, where he happened to meet Richard Summer. So after the class was over, he gave me some wine he'd made from his vineyard in, in Roseburg, which he planted in 1961. So I couldn't wait to get it home to Walnut Creek to try it out. And as soon as I got back, I pulled a cork and poured some wine in the glass and it smelled like whiskey because he was using freshly emptied whiskey barrels from Hood River Distillers to put his wine into and he didn't bother rinsing them out. So there was a pronounced whiskey characteristic to the wine. But even behind all that, I could tell there was some really nice things going on. The taste lingered and with Summer's encouragement, Erath moved north to the Willamette Valley. He got a job at an electronics company near Portland. The job at Tektronix afforded me a place to have a day job. And then while, while I was there, I spent about 8,000 miles in the family car driving around looking for potential sites. In 1968, he sank his savings into 48 acres near Newburgh, planting Pinot Noir and several other varieties. Hi there, old buddy. Hadn't seen in a long time. Class reunion. This walnut orchard, when I got here, that was, that was heavily damaged in the Columbus Day storm. And prior to the walnut orchard, they say they had, they grew potatoes and hops in, in the old days. It was 500 an acre, and I thought it was pretty pricey. To save money and be close to his vines, Dick and his family moved into an abandoned logger's cabin. Then he went to work. So did Mother Nature. In August of 1968, I think it was the wettest year on record for the month of August, and we had about eight inches of rain. At the same time, I'm trying to build a road, and every load of rock would just disappear and sink out of sight. Well, it was very wet, and that does lead to mud, doesn't it? <laughs> so. It was just the beginning. Beetles fond of walnut trees bored into his grapevines instead. And the following winter, the weakened cutting snapped during a silver thaw. You know, about this time you're ready to pack up your suitcase and head back, right? I didn't give up on the dream. I think the determination was there and it would have been easy to pack up, but didn't. We would spend many, many coffee breaks talking about winemaking because he was an amateur winemaker, I was an amateur winemaker. Dick Erath's unyielding passion helped uncork the imagination of another tech engineer. 
our neighbor next door, uh, John, said, Ron, you make good wine after four or five years of making wine. He said, why don't we start a winery? With six children, I thought, whoa, this is going to be a big step. But I said, well, let's try it. So we found this old dairy barn south of Hillsboro. Well, those silos uh, were here uh, when we bought the old dairy farm to build a winery. This was the milking parlor. And of course, there was a lot of cleanup after the cows got through. So uh, it was a rustic building, but we saw the potential uh, to be a winery also. And May 18th of 1970, Oak Knoll was born. Ron and wife Marge focused on making berry wines at first, then began producing fine varietal wines too, including Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir was not a popular variety back in the early 70s uh, because California, their, their Pinot Noirs were, were kind of flabby and they weren't, didn't have the character. I think we all believe we could make a better Pinot than California was making at the time because back then they were still saying we could plant any grape and in any place and ripen it. Most grapes can adapt to a wide variety of growing conditions, but Pinot says no. You've got to have this very little narrow band of everything's got to be right for me or I won't cooperate. In 1970, there were less than 100 acres of Vitis vinifera growing in Oregon and just five bonded wineries. David and Diana Lett were operating out of a converted turkey processing plant in McMinnville. The one thing that all of our early uh, wine community had in common was poverty. <laughs> The banks would not loan us any money, first of all, probably because we were young and because we were doing something that hadn't been done before, and there was no assurance that we would be able to pull it off. The 70s, I guess 1970 was the year, my first year of making wine. I had a California education. I did absolutely everything wrong. I picked the grapes too early. The wine came out thin and tart, and it was just a nothing wine. And I was embarrassed to call it Pinot Noir. We called it Oregon Spring Wine. Sold it for $2.65 a bottle. Had 250 cases. Took about three years to sell that. Dickie Rath was producing his first wine out of the basement of his home. Okay, so 1972, the first vintage. This is the only one that's left out of that. I think with 216 cases total, 90 cases of Pinot. I remember that my wife and I bottled it and the kids were labeling it. We didn't come here to make a lot of money. We came here because we had a dream of making really great wines. And that we also knew that we had an opportunity to create a brand new viticultural area in the world. The early pioneers protected their young industry fiercely. They joined forces early on to prevent a Southern Oregon nursery from selling virus-ridden vines. That would have been disaster. So Chuck and Dave and I went to the nursery division of the Department of Agriculture, and we got that stopped. And at the same time, we got quarantines passed. So we wanted to make sure whatever came in was clean and was disease free. That's visionary. That's saying, we have a future here. Let's not destroy it. By now, new wine growers had begun arriving in the state, most drawn to the northern Willamette Valley. This was in the late 60s, a lot of unrest going on, things that happened in California that we didn't like politically, and we were somewhat idealists in a way, and many of us wanted to get back to the land. In 1969, aerospace engineer Dick Ponzi left a comfortable job designing amusement rides for Disneyland. He and his family landed near Beaverton. And we were very naive about a lot of things. I mean, we had no business plan. Uh, we only had the vision of planting a vineyard, particularly Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and all the other varieties that we explored in Europe, in Burgundy and in Alsace. We didn't know anything. Neither one of us knew anything about farming or animals or anything. So, well, we like to drink wine, you know. and. Uh, we decided Pinot Noir was a thing because, of course, we didn't want to just do something normal. Being an engineer, I built a lot of equipment. 
I remember I built this press for our first harvest. We had four beautiful barrels of Pinot Noir, and they were probably the most cared after barrels that we've ever had. <laughs> yeah, we were highly educated. We should have known better, I guess. Wanted to have a small vineyard, never really intended to be in the wine business itself. We were going to just grow grapes and sell them to other wineries that were around here. Liberal arts graduates Bill Blosser and Susan Sokol Blosser arrived in the Willamette Valley about the same time as the Ponzi's. I was in heaven because growing things was always in my DNA someplace. I just loved uh, the whole process of getting these rootings out of the ground, sorting them, laying out the vineyard, doing the first cultivation and getting the weeds out. It was great fun. Everything was new to me, and the idea of working the equipment was actually really exciting. I loved that, partly because it was something that women didn't usually do, and that appealed to me. By the 1970s, word was getting out that fine European wine grapes could indeed be grown in Western Oregon, and that vineyard land was still cheaper than in California. When you begin to look at land prices here, versus there, and you looked at a lot of costs of doing business and getting a business started and, and whatnot, yeah, this was a good place because it was a more economical way to get going. We'll take one of the berries off of the cluster. In 1973, longtime Napa Valley winemaker Bill Fuller and wife Virginia started Tualatin Vineyards in Washington County with partner Ed Malkmus. Yeah, I was young and eager and I was excited about the possibility of starting a winery and doing it the way I wanted to do it, right from the ground up. The Shehalem Mountains drew in David and Ginny Adelsheim from Portland, convincing them this was the place to establish their original vineyard in 1971. There's an emotional specialness to it, but there's also, I mean, it doesn't taste like Pinot Noir from anywhere else in the world. And Joe and Pat Campbell, the fruit is looking pretty good over there. Soon found Gaston, Oregon, the perfect place for Elko vineyards. I think they're going to be really delicious. <laughs> Go ahead and try one. Yeah, sure. The collaborative spirit of this small but growing family of entrepreneurs would become the glue and guiding force of the industry. In the early days, it was kind of like a fraternity, where you helped each other. Uh, if you needed some yeast or, or anything, you could call uh, your neighbor or you know the closest winery. Sure, I, I'll let you have that. I don't need it right now. I think the camaraderie was just absolutely the best thing that happened to this industry. We had to be very creative and we had to be very good at scrounging from other sources and unusual sources. There was no place to buy barrels here or glass. Uh, there were no vineyard workers that were trained to do the work in the vineyards. When we planted the vineyards, we bought rejected uh, milk cartons, and you slip it over the plant, and it does several things. One is if you're uh, spot watering by hand, you can fill the milk carton with water and it'll direct the water straight down into the root zone. We had milk cartons out in the field and literally the kids on the school bus wanted to know why we were trying to grow milk. <laughs> and our early fermenters were used dairy tanks and for white wines if we needed extra storage we used stainless steel Coca-Cola barrels. People were very willing to help and share equipment. And, uh, and one time, Ron Volstek came over and uh, helped us get our refrigeration system going. He was pretty good with electronics. We wanted to see the industry grow, and we felt if everybody was making good wine, it was going to grow. Uh, if people had a problem, uh, there was nowhere else to turn except to our peers. My brother left me in 1981 to go work in Washington State. And he used to call me up and, and bitch and say, um, I don't have this piece of equipment or this is broken. I'd say, well, just, you know, there's, there's a lot of vineyards and wineries up there. Just go 
borrow something from Culligan, and I would get a lecture on, Myron, this isn't Oregon. People just don't do that kind of thing. Political science major Myron Redford bought the existing Amity Vineyards in 1974. And the way we helped each other, the main, the main vehicle was the various committees. I was on the Viticultural Committee with several other people, and we'd be looking at some problem, and then we would make a presentation at our monthly meetings, and it was just continuous. The learning curve was steep, the hours long, most had day jobs and family and friends that helped them survive. And many were raising young children alongside their vines. The first harvest that I really remember well was 1973. I was three. I really felt like one of the guys, and I was working on the harvest crew and, and was helping to make wine, you know, uh, putting them into the crusher stemmer one cluster at a time. I'd just come from driving posts in the vineyard, and little Allison, who was two or two and a half at the time, came out to meet me, and I love it because I think of it as two women of wine. In a few short years, the wine growers had begun laying a strong foundation for a new Oregon industry. But they knew that the industry's future growth depended on real estate. There were the beginnings of some housing developments on Shalem Mountain and a few other places. I mean, who doesn't want a house with a view? Uh, and yet these hillsides were the very places that were needed for grapes. In 1973, the state legislature passed Senate Bill 100. The bill mandated county officials to work with citizen groups to create a comprehensive plan protecting farmland. There was an urgency. We had a short period of time to do it. And so we jumped on that bandwagon and did some studies to, to show them how this land was actually very, very valuable farmland for the grape industry. Well, this is a map, uh, one of, I think, eight or 10, that would give us a graphic way to show the director of planning of Yamhill County the extent of land on which it would be possible to plant and grow grapes. This is the Shalem Valley. We're literally right here where that dot is. This is the Dundee Hills. I mean, the beauty of having several of us involved in this process was that, particularly people like Dick Erath, uh, he'd driven a lot of these places. Working together, they identified nearly all the county hillsides theoretically suitable for grapes. I think it was that there was so much highlighted land on this that the director of planning ultimately decided to keep the hillside zoned for agriculture. We got virtually all the land that we thought was prime grape land designated for prime farmland in that first phase of plans that came out of the state. And so that was just a huge accomplishment. By now, it was becoming evident that the growing industry was facing unique challenges requiring a unified political voice to solve. At that time, in the early 70s, uh, to call uh, California Cabernet, it only had to be 51% of that variety. Uh, we wanted Oregon wines to mean something. So we went to the Liquor Commission and said, we want Oregon wines to have at least 95% of that variety. So if you were gonna say that it was Oregon wine, it had to entirely be from Oregon. And then if it said, Willamette Valley, it had to be 100% from that Willamette Valley, and we had to collaborate to do that. We had to go to every winery, and every licensed winery in Oregon had to sign off on these things. I mean, we put through the stiffest labeling regulations in the country, and in some respects in the world. Had we waited five years, pff, couldn't have happened. Couldn't have gotten that kind of unanimity about it. At the same time, the growers agreed that if they were going to continue to protect and improve their industry, they'd need outside expertise. The whole concept here is cool climate viticulture. Because Oregon is a unique growing area, we recognize that what was going on in other parts of the world didn't, was not necessarily appropriate to what we needed. We were all focused on one goal, making better Pinot Noir, okay? 
better wine in general, but Pinot Noir was it. And we were thirsty for knowledge and getting that knowledge. Working with the state legislature, the wine growers created a special advisory board. It allowed the industry to impose a grape and wine tax on itself and use the money for research. They had a tremendous amount of knowledge about a wide range of things, but on the science or side, they were on a, on a, on a learning curve. The money helped support a research position at Oregon State University. Barney was the Johnny Appleseed of this industry. He set up workshops. He would come out to your winery. There were tons of ideas. Everyone was exploring. You've got to figure out the best winemaking practices for the fruit from that climate. You've got to figure out the best yeasts uh, or the best wine bacteria. You've got to figure out the best varieties, how to trellis them, how to crop them, how to manage them. So a lot of it was developing our own resources and having the university working with the industry to, to help them move it all along at an ever fast, faster rate. Determining the best plants or clones became an early priority. Nobody was talking about them as individual clones. All we knew was that it was Pinot Noir. And that all changed in the fall of, of 73 when Chuck Curry helped us all understand that there were a lot of selections of Pinot Noir in the world and that maybe the ones that we had were not necessarily the best for Oregon. We decided it would be a lot better if we could go directly to Europe and, and bring in clones and, then, and we could test them here in Oregon and we started doing that in 1978. During the process, France granted Oregon favored status partly because the state's strict labeling laws prohibited the use of French geographic names like Burgundy and Chablis. California used them, Gallo Hardy, Burgundy and all that. The French were really upset for a long, long time and rightfully so. We're producing cheap white wine and calling it Chablis, which is some of the best Chardonnay in the world. So they liked the fact that we respected their labeling laws and we made it illegal from the very beginning to use any of those. So they felt comfortable in sending us some of the plant material they had, which it would never have been, they never would have sent it to California or anywhere else in the country at the time. The clones were planted at cooperative vineyards and eventually at OSU's research vineyard near Alpine, Oregon. And I made replicated wines from them for quite a number of years. We had winemaker panels come in. I mean, we'd taste the wines and through that process, between tasting the wines and gathering the data and the field data, then the industry was better able to select the best ones for the future growth of the industry. You know, in the 80s, there was a big surge of new people coming into the industry, and, uh, and they needed help, and we wanted them to have help. We wanted things to be planted properly. We wanted them to plant the proper grape. We wanted to improve the quality, because one flawed wine in the market would reflect on the whole industry. The more the wine growers learned, the better their wines were becoming. But they needed to start producing great Pinot Noir quickly and consistently. In 1979, a small group of Oregon and California winemakers organized a technical retreat at a remote fishing lodge on the North Umpqua River. Really, the pH? Had gone down? No, no, it gone up. pH went up, and acid yeah, went, went down. down, and the bricks came up. We realized from the start, Pinot Noir was the unknown American wine. It was at a tremendous disadvantage from a marketing perspective, in that California didn't spend any energy on it, and Oregon was brand new. So the point was, if we're going to survive, we've got to put out high quality wines as rapidly as we can. The early fruit is very cold. Steamboat was like the early Oregon, but for the whole world. We got together, never allowed press to come. We told each other our mistakes. We opened ourselves to criticism. Uh, it smells a little bit like yeast. And then the discussion would be, okay, how did this problem come about? Has anybody else experienced this problem? What did you do about it? 
By doing that, we all learn. Today, Pinot producers from around the world collaborate at the annual event. The reason that it works is because Pinot Noir expresses the place that it grows. So if he wins a gold medal or I win a gold medal and I tell him exactly how I made my wine, his won't taste the same. So we give up nothing by sharing. We gain from the experience of our fellow makers. The wine growers call Pinot's reflection of place terroir, a French word that, while difficult to define, defines Pinot Noir like nothing else. So it's not just the slope of the land and the way the sun hits the hillside. It's how everything comes together. It's a sense of the place, of the sun, of the rain, of the soil, of our footsteps through the vineyard, of the bluebirds that fly around, that's all reflected in the taste of the wine. Pinot Noir is such a grape of place. People get excited about it because my Pinot Noir here is going to be different from Bethel Heights Pinot 20 miles down there or Sokol Blossers Pinot up in the Dundee Hills. They're all different and we rejoice in the differences. By the early 1980s, there were about 50 wineries in the state. The wine growers were attracting respect and recognition for their wines and opening tasting rooms to a curious public. But getting people to actually buy their premium wines, especially Pinot, was still a tough sell. Well, we wanted to make great wines in Oregon, but then we realized there was no market for great wines in Oregon because they hadn't existed before. Pinot Noir wasn't exactly on everybody's lips in late 70s, early 80s. And the American public was just starting to drink wine. To raise the profile of their industry, the wine growers decided to tax each other at an even higher rate and use the additional money for marketing and promotion, including television. In 1963, I found what is now at Oregon's oldest premium grape winery. My husband, Joe, and I find grape growing and winemaking very challenging. At our Umpqua Valley Winery, the emphasis is on quality, not quantity. While the campaigns helped increase awareness locally, the wine growers knew they needed national distribution even more. I always felt that the future of our industry was our ability to sell the wine away from Oregon. And that would define how successful we would be. So the wine growers hit the road together. Basically, we were teaching. We were going to every market in the country, and we did it as a group, because as individuals, we were laughed at, pretty much. We worked together, and there was no way, absolutely no way, a single person from Oregon could have sold their wine by themselves. We didn't have any idea just how few people outside of Oregon even know where Oregon is. I remember our first wine we took to San Francisco, you know, six months later I got a letter back saying nobody's interested. It's hard. Wine is very subjective and it was very difficult to get people out of state in Boston and New York to really put aside their prejudices and taste the wine. And it was almost like the wine writers had to promote it before they would then carry the wine in their shops. The year 1985 rolled in with sales looking bleak. We were trying to decide whether we should even bother picking our Pinot Noir crop because at $7.95 a bottle, we had a three-year supply of Pinot Noir. But then... New York's renowned International Wine Center held a blind taste test to pick the finest wines in the world. They picked Oregon wines. The tasting blew everybody's mind. First of all, the tasters admitted that they could not distinguish which was Burgundy and which was Oregon, and the top five wines were Oregon. They were stunned. We were stunned. The smoldering industry was about to ignite, 
Skeptical wine clubs replicated tastings across the country with the same results, and praise for Oregon wine came pouring in, in particular from an influential national wine critic. Robert Parker was one of the driving forces that brought us onto the national stage in the early 80s. It was, I think, the first recognition that, look, there are many wineries here doing great things. People were curious, and they wanted to know, you know, what's this Oregon thing? We wished that we'd had 10 times as much wine we could have sold at that point, but our stocks disappeared almost overnight. So we're talking an incredible effect. I mean, the sucking sound was all the warehouses in Oregon emptying of Oregon Pinot. Listen to what the world is saying about the premium wines of Oregon. You can tell an Oregon wine by its finesse. People had started hearing the Oregon story, and they were fascinated by it. It was so different from any other wine region in which there were small groups that identified only with their own wines. Oregon wines, world-class quality right here at home. And in some sense, people like Myron and David Adelsheim and Dave Lepp were international rock stars of the, of the wine industry. And uh, that was a huge uh, change from the uh, hippie boys up north. From the early days of the industry, Oregon and France had been forging a unique bond with a special wine. And curiosity on the French side was building for this rogue producer on the other side of the world. Robert Drouin was a respected winemaker in Burgundy. He'd organized the 1980 rematch between Irie Vineyard 75 Pinot Noir and the top French Burgundies of the time. I think that's when my father realized there's something special about Oregon. It's not like uh, they were lucky, it's, it's, it's just a good wine. In 1986, Veronique Drouin asked her father to help her find a winemaking internship in California. And he said he could, but that he wondered why she wouldn't want to come to Oregon and, and, and work here. So I kind of looked at him and said, where is Oregon? I, yeah, I'm ashamed to say this, but uh, I had no idea Oregon was growing Pinot Noir. And uh, I said, fine, I'll, I'm happy to go to Oregon. She worked as an intern and scrubbed and ran presses and hooked up hoses and all the things that you do during harvest. And one year later, in June 87, I remember very well we were in Bordeaux, David Alsam calls my father and says, Robert, you have to come to Oregon and see something. I think it was a 90-acre piece of property was for sale, and here was the price, and were you interested? And he's kind of a deliberate guy. It took about 10 seconds to say, yes, I'm interested. And we go up the hill with David Alsam. We go up the hill, and we arrive here, where there's just wheat and the trees. No vines, no wine, nothing. And both Robert and I were like, wow, this is incredible. Robert Duen purchased the hilltop property near Dundee. The welcoming we got was just amazing. It could have been New Zealand or another place, but I think Robert felt the best was Oregon. It was the beginning of Domaine Drouin, Oregon. But that was a big impact at the time. A lot of people who doubted that we could be a serious wine region, no longer could express that same doubt. All of that started to build as an industry, and that was very important because in the beginning, we had to establish that we were an industry and not an oddity of one winery or two wineries making great wines. The time was right to promote their new industry in a premier event. Working with the city of McMinnville, the wine growers launched the annual International Pinot Noir Celebration. The vision was to bring together the top Pinot Noir producers in the world, along with fabulous food, top chefs, and to have a weekend that would have enough technical knowledge that the industry would be interested, but not so nerdy that sophisticated consumers wouldn't also enjoy it. 
The food and wine pairings are exquisite, uh, better than I've had almost anywhere else in the world. Pinot Noir works with more kind of food. It, you know, it can work with fish. It can work with even richer dishes like meat. And, and, and that makes it easier to pair with food. And wine should be with food. Wine is food. You have Oregon winemakers here who are pouring their wine among the greatest Pinot Noir producers in the world. And it's just absolutely brilliant. I would say that because they've been going for 25 years strong, it's because it's not just marketing, it's because the wines live up to their international peers. In 1984, some 20 years after the first winemaking pioneers arrived, the Willamette Valley was named Oregon's first official American viticultural area. Today, Oregon boasts 16 AVAs across the state, six sub-areas in the Willamette Valley alone, each with its own terroir. And Pinot Noir basks in glory as the state's premier signature wine. It's hard to believe today that no one seemed to like it. It was not made right. People weren't making it the way we were doing it in Oregon. They weren't raising it in the area that we were the cool climate. I think this was the birthplace of New World Pinot Noir. Today, more than 400 wineries beckon visitors from every which way. Oregon ranks fourth in the nation in the production of wine. And the industry pumps nearly $3 billion annually into the state's economy. Personally, I don't think it would be as big as it's gotten. Uh, but I never doubted that we would not be successful. There's a demand and an interest in Oregon wines around the world, which is really nice, but with that comes more competition. So trying to maintain that collaborative spirit that helped get the Oregon industry started while also uh, staying in business <laughs> can, be, can be a challenge. And Oregon has been a wonderful example of what an industry can do to make a living, increase the prestige of the state, bring money into the state, and keep the land uh, healthy at the same time. The Pinot, and it tastes pretty good. I mean, it still has a. I hope we're three, still yeah. singing the praises of Oregon as a high quality producer of Pinot Noir 40 years from now. From the very beginning, the pioneers of Oregon's wine industry took themselves and their wine seriously. It just took a while to convince the rest of the world they weren't kidding. There was a much higher calling than trying to imitate some other place. And that goal was to figure out who we wanted to be for ourselves, and what it was that we could do that nobody else in the world could do. You know, we had a chance to really make a brand new viticultural area in the world. And we've done that. And I'm really proud of that. If you ask any grape grower in Burgundy, or anywhere, Oh, it was a good idea to put these out this year. Mm -hmm. What do you do to your wines to make them so wonderful? He'll point out to his vineyard. This is where the wine is created, and it's natural. Harvest is over for another year. The golden vines will soon go dormant. And as winter sets in, their life cycle will begin anew. In the spring, new buds will unfurl, and the wine growers will once again gamble with the weather ahead. Because in Oregon, harvest brings no guarantees. Although Dick Erath sold his winery in 2006, he didn't exactly retire. Today, you'll find him back in his garage, brewing up a batch of Pinot Noir. The father of the Oregon wine industry, Richard Summer, died in 2009. In 2011, the State House of Representatives honored his legacy. 
Charles Corey eventually returned to California, where he died in 2004. Today at David Hill Winery, the old and gnarled vines are rooted deep. They, like the elder vines down the valley, continue to produce some of the finest wines in the world. That's the old French theory, too, that a grape has to struggle. No, no, that, no, the grape grower has to struggle. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> we walked out here every night for 40 years. He's definitely here. He's all around here. David Lett, who came to be known as Papa Pino, passed away in 2008. It was David's ideal to produce a wine that would express the terroir of this particular place where we are. The intention and the philosophy and the love of the winemaker, everything that goes into making wine from a particular place. So many hopes and dreams are held in these fragile leaves and tender shoots which seemed a few months ago to be only dead sticks pushed into the Oregon mud. There seems such a harmony between the earth, the sun, the cool breezes. I can't help but feel now that success will be ours. There's more about Grapes of Place on Oregon Experience online. To learn more or to order a DVD of the show, visit opb.org. Funding for Oregon Experience is provided by the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation, the Oregon Cultural Trust, and viewers like you. Additional support provided by Kay Kitagawa and Andy Johnson-Laird. Thank you. <laughs>